Okay, understand Councillor Allison is present. Councillor John Bradley. Here. Councillors Buchanan, Callahan, Cowie, Craig and Devlin are all present. Councillor Mary Donnelly. Councillors Dormant, Dryborough and Hamilton are present. I have apologies from Councillor Harrow. I understand that Councillor Kenny McCreary is present as a substitute. Uh, Councillors Horsham and LeBlond are also present. Councillor Martin Lennon. Sorry, present. <clears throat> Councillor Lockhart is present. Councillor Joe Law. Here. Councillor David McLaughlin. Councillor Lynn Nalen. Present. Councillor Nugent is present. Councillor John Ross. Councillor Scott, Shearer, Stevenson, Thompson and Wartaw are all present. I also note that Councillor Alan Faulkner is attending. Councillor Faulkner, could you please indicate who you're substituting for? Councillor Faulkner. I'm not substituting. You're just uh, attending as an observer? Correct. Okay. Okay, that's the student taken. Thank you. If we can now pass back to the chair for today's business. Thank you, Stuart. Do we have any declarations of interest? Don't see any hands. We agree the minutes of previous meeting in pages three to eight. Agree, Chair. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item three and four, which we'll take together, but they'll be agreed separately. And Bernard will take us through the items. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Chair. I'll run through item three first. Planning permission is sought for the change of use of agricultural land to to form a children's outdoor nursery with associated access and parking. The site is enclosed by a mixture of fencing and hedging at present and access taken via Blue Nose Road. The proposal would involve the relocation of an existing child minding business operating from one Blue Nose Road. The present business operates from a residential property and currently accepts up to seven children on a daily basis. The proposal would see the operation relocate to the application site and increase the number of children being cared for up to a total of 10. There would be... there would be no alterations to the staffing levels proposed, which is currently a total of two in the existing business. As part of the proposal, five parking spaces would be provided along with a turning area. In terms of the development plan, the site is identified as part of the general urban area within the proposed local plan, which reflects the up-to-date views of the Council. In the adopted local plan, the site is identified as a potential housing site. A separate application has been submitted for a port cabin, and I will go over that application once I've finished here. In terms of consultation responses, these are summarised in section four of the report, and I would highlight the road's response they have noted the existing access has already been used for the childcare facilities on Blue Nose Road and conclude that the expected increase in traffic would be minor and the connection between Blue Nose and Brownlee Road would remain sufficient. They have no objection to the proposal and have recommended conditions, including that a dilapidation survey is undertaken. A total of 19 objections have been submitted and the matters raised are detailed in section five of the report. The main issues raised relate to access, noise, and the principle of an outdoor nursery operating at this location. The site is identified in the proposed plan as part of the general urban area, and the principle of an outdoor nursery at this location is acceptable. 
It's not considered that there would be unacceptable noise or disturbance from the operation of the outdoor nursery. The existing nursery already operates from residential premises close by, and the current proposal would only see a potential increase of up to three children on a daily basis, and this is not considered to be excess excessive or significant. The access and parking arrangements have been assessed by the Council's road service, and they've raised no objection. Overall, the proposal is considered to be acceptable since it complies with the relevant policies contained in the adopted and proposed local plans and will not have an unacceptable impact on the amenity of the surrounding area. The principle of an outdoor nursery operating from this location is acceptable and it's recommended that the application is approved subject to conditions. I'll now quickly go through agenda item four. Agenda item four is for the same site and seeks permission for the installation of temporary accommodation for use in association with the outdoor nursery. The temporary building would be approximately 14.5 metres by 4 metres and take the form of a porta cabin, providing welfare facilities associated with the day to day running of the outdoor nursery. There have been six objections submitted in relation to this application, which raise similar issues to those associated with the earlier application for a change of use. Additionally, points regarding the specifics of the proposed temporary building have also been raised and connections with utilities. The design, location and scale of the proposed temporary building are all considered to be acceptable and would not detract unacceptably from the amenity of the surrounding area. Due to the nature of the application and the type of building proposed, a condition will be applied which requires the building to be removed after five years and the ground restored to its original condition. It is anticipated that if the business is permitted and continues to operate, that an application to extend this time period is likely, or that the applicant may in the future look to erect a more permanent type of building. The proposal is considered to be acceptable and it is recommended for approval subject to condition. Back to you, Chair. Thank you, Bernard. Any questions for Bernard? Councillor Thompson. Can you hear me okay? Hello? Yes. Right. Just as a, a, a maybe if you could give us a comment there, it's just a definition of, you know, it's, it's not going to be permanent. How, how long is permanent or not permanent? And once the five years, trial as a trial period I don't know can can they then continue on do they come back in or is that just set in stone Bernard through you chair um, in, in terms of the use that is proposed as a permanent use of the site for an outdoor nursery the the temporary aspect it relates to the proposed porta cabin and there would be a condition which requires at the end of a five year period that the building would be removed and the ground reinstated, reinst reinstated sorry, to its original condition. It would, if the application is approved, it would be for up, up to the operator to decide prior to the five years expiring, do they want to submit an application to extend that five year period or do they want to apply for um, a different building, which might take the form of a more permanent building, or they may decide that for whatever reason it might no longer be required and they could simply remove it. So there's a few options available for the proposed operator. Thank you, Bernard. Councillor Hamilton. Thank, thanks, Chair. Um, I've just got I've got a few questions. Um, I know the the site um, well, being being from the village, and I was um, I've just got a bit of concern about. Um, I know the roads don't have an objection, but I've got a bit of concern about um, the the position about more traffic being on that road. The road the road's not. Um, it, it's like a track more than than an actual road and it's at the brow of um, a hill at Brownlee Road. So I've just got a bit of a, a, a concern about um, if it's bad weather or stuff like that, that there might be 10 cars parked on the brow, brow of that hill um, and it might cause cause issues there. Also um, about the, the porta cabin, um, 
I think five years isn't really temporary in in my eyes, but um, have the if the applicants indicated what what they're planning to do after the five years, or they have the is it just the the five years just now? Um, and what is the spec of the porter cabin? I think I saw that it was going to be used for toilets and stuff like that. But are the are the kids going to be in the porter cabin safe? It's a, a day like today, and the, the weather's bad. Um, thanks. Thanks, Bernard. Would you like to come back in? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> In, in terms of the access and, and the parking, Councillor Hamilton, that, that has obviously been considered as part of the, the application. The existing childminding or nursery facility operates on Blue Nose Road and it's operated by the, the residents that live there. So there are two members of staff at present and they cater for up to, to seven children. So lo looking at it from a, as part of the planning assessment, what they are looking to increase it by is a total of three children on a daily basis. So we've also in put attached a condition which would limit the maximum number of children to 10. If they were going to do something differently, they would also require um, potentially to renew a license through the care inspector, which is separate from planning. But nonetheless, if they wanted to take on any additional children beyond the 10, they would need to come back with a formal application. As a result of that, restricting it to the additional three children as part of the consultation process, roads haven't raised any issues. And I don't think that the additional three is excessive or going to result in um, any unacceptable access or parking issues arising. What, what is allowed to happen just now can obviously continue, but looking at the change, it's not considered to be unacceptable. In, in terms of the, the porter cabin, they, they haven't indicated to us what they would want to do at the end of that five year period. I suspect that if they get permission, they will probably um, look to their business plan and just see how things progress. And they might get an early indication, but the onus will be for the operator to come back and speak to us and consider what their options are and decide how they want to proceed. In terms of um, at the temporary nature of it, in planning terms, the majority of applications are permanent. So it's, it's not often that we do restrict um, what we do on occasion. And in this instance, it was fairly appropriate to, to give it a five year period. And finally, just about in terms of the, the port cabin itself, it, it would offer welfare facilities, whether it would be storage, toilets, um, and also, you know, as you say, if it's a day like today, then I would expect that the children, whether they are inside for some of the day or whilst they're taking snacks or, or lunches, etc., I would expect it to operate along those lines. So, and they might be, depending how they wish to operate it, they might wish to have some children outside at one time and some um, playing in the port cabin. And, and mix it about if that answers your question. Thank you, Bernard. Councillor Donnelly? Chair. Chair, my hand's been up for a while. Chair, sorry, could I just say as well, Councillor Donnelly entered the meeting after these items um, commenced, so she's not able to participate in the, in the items. Chair, can I ask my question? You're muted, Chair. Yes, sorry, David, on you go. OK. Thank you. Um, like Councillor Hamilton, I'm a local member. I know this uh, area well. Blue Nose Road is a private road, and as Lindsay has described it, it is little more than a gravel track that accesses a number of houses. There has always been issues with that being a private road as to who maintains it, uh, any potholes and drainage issues that are on that road. Now, 
I see from the report that um, the roads department are looking for a remedial survey to see what requires to be done to maintain the road. My concern is that who pays for that remedial work to be done and who maintains it over a longer period of time? And would the committee get an additional report at some point should the roads department decide to put conditions onto this application? I'm also concerned that um, Blue Nows Road is sometimes used as an access to the green space around law, and I would want some assurances that there'd be no uh, blocking off of the road at any stage so that walkers and other residents could enjoy the access to the green space beyond the village boundary. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bernard. Um, <clears throat> I'll just pick up on your, your last point, Councillor Sheeran, you know, just about access. In terms of the application itself, um, there aren't any proposals to restrict access for um, pedestrians, etc. who may already use that. So there's nothing as part of this proposal to prevent that happening. And I would expect that the current arrangements would remain in place. In terms of the, the planning application, it's proposed that there are conditions just about um, the surfacing of the access the dilapidation survey and parking and the onus would be on the applicant to discharge those conditions and ensure that they are implemented prior to um, the use commencing. Now, some of those they may require to go back and do a bit of work and come in with further information. But once that is agreed, the responsibility would be for the applicant. Now, in planning terms, it's not something that we stipulate who must do the work. It will be the operator, um, and in this case, the for the outdoor nursery, to ensure that they discharge those conditions and that they can um, get the agreement of roads and planning and ensure that their business can begin to operate. But if they don't discharge those conditions, then they may not be able to commence works. Thank you, Bernard. Supplementary chair. OK, on you go. Bernard, and who would look after the long term maintenance? Is there any condition going to be applied? Because obviously, if this is running for five years or more. On a, a road that is in very poor condition at the moment, unless that road is properly maintained, it's going to deteriorate further. And I notice there are no conditions on it regarding the drainage issues that have been raised. Bernard? Could I bring in Fraser just to give some feedback just on your road specific comment, uh, Councillor Shearer? And I'll just check about the, the, the drainage details and I'll come back in. Fraser, if that is yep. OK with you. Thanks, Bernard. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the the road, um, Blue Nose Road, is classed as a, a road rather than an access, and as such, in terms of access, um, it's got to be kept open. It's not something that a gate could go in. Uh, I mentioned that because the a private road is exactly the same as a, um, a public road. Um, it's just that the, the maintenance of that um, private road uh, must be um, it's the responsibility of the owner of the road, uh, Council. So the council, we wouldn't be able to um, step in and um, agree uh, what needed to be done there. It just needs to be kept in a, a safe condition, um, but it would be the responsibility of the, uh, the the owner of the road. Thank you, Fraser. So, OK, Councillor Sheila. So we have no powers. If the road deteriorates significantly, we have no powers to force the owner to repair that road. Is that correct? I think uh, there is something if it goes into a, a dangerous condition, I think it is, Council. I would need to double check that in the Road Scotland Act. Um, I think the Council may have powers if it gets into a 
a very, very um, bad condition. Um, but in terms of kind of general maintenance, um, it's for the, the owner of the road, yeah. Chair, that seems very a very, very loose reply, and I'm not criticising the officer, but it does leave us open to complaints from the other residents who use Blue Nows Road as their access road to their properties, that if that road becomes in a terrible condition, there is no recourse for them to get repairs done other than a legal recourse. And that seems very unsatisfactory to me. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. It was just to come back in with regard to Councillor Shearer's point there. We, we do have the condition which um, about the dilapidation survey, and it does require that after that's undertaken um, and agreed with the council, any repair works to the road in question would be required to be undertaken by the applicant and to the satisfaction of the council's road services before the development is brought into use. Um, so I think there is a, is a degree of comfort there that the existing access would, if it's necessary, be upgraded to a suitable condition at the present time. And whilst there is maybe not a control about what the applicant does in the future down the line, but there is an expectation that if they wanted people to continue to come and operate and visit the premises and drop their children off, that they would maintain it in an acceptable condition. Thank you, Bernard. <laughs> There's another hand up. <laughs> Who's it, Stuart? It's me, Richard Councilor Lockhart. Lockhart yep. Go ahead, Councillor Lockhart. Right. Uh, well, I'm really completely with, with David on this. I am the proud owner of quite a lot of unmade road, and I know exactly the problems that develop once the traffic levels build up. A road that maybe has a little traffic suddenly gets a lot more, goes into holes, everybody looks the other way and no one is responsible. So frankly, I think you're making a noose for yourselves by leaving it as loose as it is at the moment. And I personally would be moved to try and suggest that planning permission is not granted until such time as the actual ownership, resolution and maintenance of that road has been properly bottomed out. Because you'll be left holding the baby, it'll be full of holes, I don't know what the road looks like, but if it's already in bad nick, it can only get worse because that's what happens when you have holes and cars drive into them. So I'll be very nervous about this. Thank you, Paul. And you wanted to come in? Thanks, Chair. I mean, I am in, in the hands of, of Fraser, who might be able to, to add something to this. And um, certainly you, you can defer the application members if that's what you want to do. Just, just to go back to the issue of proportionality, um, and as Bernard explained in his presentation, the Childminder currently runs a business off that road with seven children. The, the proposal then increases that to 10 children. Uh, I mean, my my fear would be, and, and maybe Fraser can, can confirm this, how would we know if that road deteriorated, that it was purely as a result of the additional three cars a day dropping their kids off compared to the seven that do now, as opposed to the other users of that road having lots of visitors perhaps operating a business and using the road. I think it would be very, very difficult to control that. And, and you know, just going back, it is a temporary um, permission. It will be reviewed um, if the applicant wants to come back and, and renew or, or extend the, the permission thereafter. But there are seven children being dropped off on that road at present. This increases it to 10. It's not a major increase. Thanks, Chair. I don't know if Fraser wants to come back in on some of that, please. Yes. Uh, in terms of, I mean, the, the pilot road, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it would be it was, uh, down to a, a private party to maintain the road. Um, it's the same with many private roads um, around South Lanarkshire and, and through, through Scotland. Um, I think one of the, the things you need to remember is, of course, that if there was a pothole and someone damaged their car uh, in a pothole, then the responsibility for that would be would be with the owner of the road to maintain, um, and so they do have a responsibility as as part of their ownership of that uh, to maintain it. Um, I, I don't think I've got much more to add than that. 
Thank you, Fraser. Council Lockhart, you want to come back in? Uh, yes, please. Just to come back on that, um, in terms of co-ownership and all the rest of it, I've been involved in not just my own, but in a couple of other roads, um, which are private roads, and they've gone into holes. And the fact is, is that people don't want to spend any money. And someone comes along and says, right, we've all got to agree to repair this road. They all look the other way and nothing happens. And I mean, I've seen this in, on several occasions. All you, I, I agree that another three children is um, not a huge number. It's another six journeys, if you like, through the same potholes. It just makes them worse. I just think you're making a rod for your own back without some firm grip, if you like, on what is going to happen with that road. I don't know what the existing conditions are on the existing terms for road maintenance, but I'm assuming, in theory, it's shared by all the people who have access of it. Thank you. Councillor Scott wants to come in. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me now? There seems to be a, a, a bit of an echo on my life. Can you see that? I think it's important, and I see that Councillor Shearer and Councillor Loghart of, uh, and Pauline have mentioned deferral. If they want to move down the, the road of a deferral, uh, I'd be happy to support uh, with more stringent conditions in relation to the roads. Uh, the, the one point, further point I want to make is about the temporary nature of the porter cabin. I've never known a five-year consent without any compulsion on the applicant to make it permanent, to make a permanent building on the site. Because it's theoretically, the, at the end of five years, there could be another five-year extension, another five-year extension after that. Then you've basically got a, a temporary accommodation lasting maybe 15, 20. So I'd certainly support any deferral if Councillor Sheer or Councillor Lockhart would want to get out now. Thank you. Councillor Craig wants to come in. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, I live on a private road, so uh, I understand uh, people's concerns uh, over private roads. Uh, <clears throat> but in the papers itself, it, it, you know, it's quite clear it's a private road. And uh, the... Uh, person putting in this, uh, this application would have to reach agreement with the owner of the road. Now, a private road can have many owners or, or, or one owner or whoever uh, as it develops throughout the, the years, but uh, it would be up as a, as a private contract with the, the I think it's uh, Molesley Estate. Uh, they would have to reach an agreement with Molesley Estate about uh, the condition of the road and how they would use it and everything else. Uh, I mean, I had to pay a couple of thousand pounds for my permission to use this private road. I've no doubt uh, they would be doing something similar, but that's really, it's a private contract. And it's not something that we could really get involved in, although I do appreciate uh, the, the problems these things can cause. But uh, as far as the, the paper goes, I think it's, it's pretty clear. So, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Allison. It was along the lines of what Peter was saying there, so I'm not sure. What I would maybe ask is, is it possible to ask for a legal agreement to be drawn up between the various parties um, as a condition? Or is that putting a veto on it by the other houses on the uh, private road? Because I don't really like the idea of uh, restricting a local business, small local business expanding, but the roads issue, these private roads, um, uh, two of the problems that have been highlighted by Councillor Shearer and Locker. And if we can do anything at all to ease that, it certainly will take away a lot of hassle in the future. Thank you. Paul, do you want to come in and respond to that one? Um, I mean, I might need some legal advice, but it is my view that, no, we can't do that. You know, the ownership of the road and land ownership is not normally an issue in 
in planning, I mean, uh, just coming back to something Councillor Allison said, I just say to members that this is a small business. Um, it's trying to run a small business. They employ staff. They're meeting a need by supporting people who, you know, who have to go to work and need somebody to look after their children. So there is a, a, a fairly strong economic development argument for this proposal as well. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up. Oh, sorry, someone else just put, put a hand up. Do you know who it is, Stuart? Councillor McGeady. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, can I maybe just ask what the condition of the road is at present? Um, I mean, is it, is it the holes at the moment or is it all tarmite or, or whatever? Maybe a, maybe a question for Fraser, I would think. Thank you. Thank you. Fraser? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the, the road's not in a, a, a great condition. There are some potholes. Um, it's a loosely bound material. It's, it's not a, an asphalt finish by any manner. It means it, it never has been, I don't think. Um, yeah, and it's subject to all sorts of weather that you would make it worse at this time of year as well. OK, thank you. Thank you, Fraser. Councillor Sheeran. Thank you, Chair. Um, just from local knowledge for Councillor McCreary, it is a gravel road, Kenny, basically that's not maintained on any regular basis. There are potholes, there are drainage issues, and I understand where Councillor Lockhart's coming about deferring this till we get get things sorted out, but also hear what the officers are saying that this is a private road, therefore we have limited powers over it. I would only say that I would feel better if there was conditions applied to this application that said you have a maintenance responsibility and that should this road, A, I think it does need some upgrading and then B, it needs maintaining. And if that was in some way highlighted to the owner, whether it's, I don't think the entire road is owned by Molesley Estate, Peter, it may, part of it may be or part may not. I think it was a uh, number one Blue Nows Road that owned most of the road, um, but I could be wrong. I'm not, I couldn't swear to that. But I just, what I don't want to see happening is what Councillor Lockhart highlighted that four, five years down the line or two or three years down the line, the road's in a terrible condition. The neighbours start to complain to either myself or Councillor Hamilton to say, what are you going to do about these potholes? And we go, nothing we can do. I would suggest you write to Pauline Elliott as head of the department and say, what are you going to do about it? OK. Thank you, Pauline. Do you want to respond? I think, yes, and again, I probably need Fraser. I don't know how we could put a condition that just this one nursery operator is responsible for repairing and maintaining that road. I mean, there may be a perception because they, if, if permission is granted, are going to have 10 cars, up to 10 cars using the road every day. But then the other users of the road are going to be up and down that road. I mean, I, I don't honestly know how we can say that the onus for all the damage to that road is, is down to one party. And, and that would give me some concern. So, um, I, I mean, I don't know. And I, and I mean, I'm not an expert by any means whether such a condition would even be competent. And I would have to seek further advice on that. Thank you, Pauline. Councillor Hamilton. Thanks. Baron, can you confirm who does own the road? Because in the um, application, it says that um, it's noted that the applicant was in ownership of Blue Nose Road. Um, who maintains it just now? And is Molesley is Estate involved? Thank you, Bernard. Bernard. Um, the, it was raised by one of the objectors about Maudsley Estate being the owner, but based on the information that was presented to the council as part of the submission, the, the applicants have advised that they are own the road um, and they are responsible for it. In terms of um, points, if that, if that addresses your question, Councillor Hampton, yeah. Um, in terms of the point that Councillor Shearer was making, um, and I mentioned it earlier, just in terms of the condition 8 
that is proposed, which requires a dilapidation survey to be undertaken, and then any repair works to the road in question shall be undertaken, we've said by the applicants, and that's to the satisfaction of the Council's roads and transportation services. Um, whilst it might be, be difficult to maintain the, that in the long term, and as Pauline mentioned, just about who would be responsible for it, um, there could be an option there that, that the last sentence of that condition was revised slightly so that um, it required it to be kept maintained in a, to an acceptable standard. I don't know if that would address the points that um, you were raising. Chair, if I could come back on Bernard's point. Yes, Bernard, I just about to invite you in. Yeah. yeah. Bernard, if that was done, I would find that acceptable. It's, it's a reminder to the applicant that they have an ongoing responsibility to keep the road maintained. And I know what Pauline's saying, it's a private road. We don't have uh, the ability to put uh, conditions on it which are unenforceable. I understand that. But if you could amend that last condition, just as you suggested, I would find that much more acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Elson wanted to come in. Yeah, just to highlight in the papers at 4.3 in the first application, it states quite clearly that the applicant is in ownership of the road. Um, so I'm not sure uh, where you go with that. It says road. Um, why should we be putting conditions on uh, what he does with his own property? Thank you, Pauline. You want to come back in? Yes, thanks, Chair. Just in, in the interest of moving this forward, if it is acceptable to the committee, as indicated by Councillor Shearer, we could take that condition away and look at the wording of it and try to tighten that up if the committee would agree to, to delegate that to myself and yourself in, in conjunction with our, our Rhodes colleagues um, and tighten that up. That could be a way forward. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Pauline. Council Lockhart, I think you get your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I, I would go with that. I think we don't want to make it too complicated, but I really do worry that that, that, that people start to look the other way the moment they are, they're asked to actually put their hands in their pockets. But I, I'll accept what David has said. Okay, thank you. I'll move the report. I'll second it, Chair. Agree the report. Agreed. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item five. Thank you, Thank you, Chair. Sorry, can I just clarify so that's items three and four that have been moved and accepted? Oh, sorry, sorry, apologise. Yeah. Oh, I'll move item three first of all. Second that, Chair. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. And I'll move item four. I'll second that. Agreed. 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 Read. Thank you. Sorry for the confusion. Now moving on to agenda item five, page 35 to 46. I'm trying to take a slide item. Thank you, Tony. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, before I summarise the report, um, just to update members that since the report was finalised, we've received a further eight representations, making 17 in total. We also received last week um, a request for a hearing. Um, following discussion between yourself, Chair, and uh, and Pauline, it was decided or agreed that the request of hearing didn't accord with our policy and guidance on hearing, so uh, we, we said no to that. So, turning then to the to the report itself, it's an application by Banks Renewables um, for the erection of a 120 metre high wind monitoring mast um, for a temporary period of three years. The sites, um, it's, it's on the summit of Score Hill, which lies to the east of the M74, closest junction with the A70, and it's just to the south of a very small settlement called Uddington. Um, the mass itself, it's, it's only 6.5 centimetres wide, and it's of a lattice construction with meteorological equipment located at intervals running up the mast and with wind measuring equipment at its tip. 
The mast will be held in place by guide cables anchored into the ground. Bed flight diverters are proposed five metre um, intervals on the guide wires. The proposal also involves um, the erection of temporary protective fencing around the equipment, and that would be two metres in height at, at its maximum. Um, due to the temporary nature of the proposals and the, and the equipment involved, um, all the equipment would be tracked to the site without the need for a creation of a new access or haul road. Um, the applicants have advised that the, the, the proposal, it's, it's in relation to gathering data for a potential 62, meet, 62 turbine wind farm within the surrounding area. An application hasn't been submitted yet for those proposals, but the council did receive a scope and opinion request consultation from the government, Scottish government and Eco energy consent unit back in January. Now, scope and opinion request, it's a technical um, exercise required to be carried out to allow relevant um, consultees to comment on the proposed scope of a future environmental impact assessment that would have to be submitted with, with the application. Consultation responses um, are explained in section four of the report. Um, Note in particular, none of the um, consultees who are, um, who've got a, an interest in aviation safety have objected to the application. In terms of representations, um, they're set out in section five of the report. Um, as I said at the beginning, nine letters were submitted before the report was finalised and a fair has been submitted since, since then. The main grounds of objection from, um, from the objectors is that the, um, the, the relating the mast to the proposed um, wind farm um, that might follow on from this proposal and they consider that the, the, the landscape in the area isn't suitable for a large scale wind farm. In response to that, I would say this application for the mast relates only to the erection of it, of that only. And it's, it's intended to provide data to inform the future submission of the application for the wind farm. So granting permission in this case would set any precedent or make any opinion in relation to the, um, to the erection of turbines in the area. Um, and the suitability of the potential wind farm on the site would require a wholly different assessment compared to this one in terms of particular landscape capacity, but also other material considerations. That, that will be subject to a, of a future assessment and, and report to committee. One additional um, matter has been raised by um, an objector, um, and that refers to um, concerns raised by WASAS in relation to their response to the scope and opinion request for the proposed wind farm. And that's in terms of the impact on scheduled monument, monument at Wildshaw Hill. Now, in response to that, um, that monument is over two kilometres away from, um, from the site. Um, so the winter relationship is very much reduced, particularly in terms of the, um, the very slim line nature of, of the mast. And also this proposal, is, it's for a temporary consent for three years only. So even if there was um, determined to be a, an impact on that monument, it would only be for temporary period. It wouldn't be a permanent, uh, any permanent damage. So turning to the assessment in conclusion, and um, that's set out in section six of the report. The key thing um, in this case is that the, the, the mast is 120 metres in height, and so there would be a visual impact on a landscape, but it's considered that its lattice construction would reduce that visibility um, within the landscape. It would soften the mast and it wouldn't wouldn't have a, wouldn't be appear as a solid object on the landscape. And it's also, as I said, um, it's only for a three-year period, which would ensure there wouldn't be any permanent impact on the landscape. So in this case, then we, we consider that the proposal accords with the development plan. And um, the recommendation is to grant consent for a temporary period of three years. Thank you, Tony. Any questions for Tony? Don't see any hands. Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Allison. Thanks, Chair. Um, reading your papers, I can understand the policy behind this being a, entirely separate from the wind farm proposal, if it ever becomes an application. But there is a lot of concern within the community that um, if this area mm, is designated as not being suitable for wind farms, as I believe they have 
indicated, why on earth would we be wanting to put up a an anometer that is basically only to identify whether the wind speeds are suitable for a wind farm. It has no other benefit. Surely it saves a lot of time, if they are correct, that this is not suitable for a wind farm. Why on earth are we going down a line of allowing the anometer? I mean, technically you're saying they're not connected, but in everybody's opinion, they are. Tony? Yes, th thanks, Chair. Through you. Um, yes, I mean, we, I, I fall back on the, on the um, standard response that every application has to be considered on its merits. In this case, it's it's for the mast only and, and nothing more than that. The, the, the mast um, proposal, it's to, it's to help the applicants in their design process and also to, to determine if this site is suitable to create a wind farm in the first place. So, um, so that it is a legitimate situation. Um, any application for a wind farm would be assessed against policy, both national and local, and also our um, supplementary guidance on, on renewable energy. Landscape character and the impact on that would be a, a very a key issue when, when we came to do that. Um, but that's not for this for this forum, um, it'll be for a future application and, and report. But as I say, the, the MAST is, is part of that design process and it's entirely legitimate for the applicants to, to submit that at this present time. Thank you, Tony. Councillor Lockhart? Oh. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm um, rowing behind Alex Allison on this one. I mean, I, I, frankly, if ever there was a thin end of a large wedge, this seems to be it. And um, I don't see any point in, in going through all of this cost and hassle if you're not going to build anyway. And uh, paragraph, I think it was 5.2b, one of those application forms sums it all up. This site is part of a turbine-free corridor that extends blah, blah, blah. Um, a wind farm would be unacceptable in this area, but if it's a turbine-free um, area and it's already designated as such, it just strikes me as this guy is willfully throwing money down the drain in order to prove that it's a lovely place for a wind farm, but you're not going to get it. I don't follow. Thank you, Pauline. You want to come in? Thanks, Chair. I mean, I absolutely understand members' thought processes. Why do you want an anometer if you're not actually going to build the wind farm? Then you should just refuse this because you're going to refuse the wind farm. But we don't have an application for a wind farm. We've got an application for a mast, which we've assessed through all the planning policies, and there are no planning reasons to refuse that. Um, when and if it, the site may or may not be suitable for a wooden farm, but at the moment we don't know what that wooden farm looks like. We don't know where the turbines are going to go. We can't do an assessment of it. And therefore it, it would it would just not be competent to refuse the mast on that basis because we're talking hypotheses and we're talking about judging and determining an application that we don't have and indeed may never have. Albeit we do know that this mast is a preamble for a wind farm. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Pauline. Councillor Alston, you want to come back in? Yeah, apologies. I tried to come back in with supplementary, but I pressed the wrong button. Um, Tony, just confirm the process uh, going on from here. If the anometer, well, not the anometer goes up, generates information and an application comes in, would that be to us or would that be to the Scottish Government because of the scale of the project? And therefore, in terms of the principle of having a wind farm here, is this not our opportunity? Um, not in terms of wind speed uh, and stability of the wind speed that the anometer identifies, but all the other issues around a potential wind farm. Because that's the only reason that this is going on. Don't we have a responsibility then to identify whether um, that information will ever be relevant? So in, in terms of the process, um, Councillor Allison, um, the, the applicants have indicated, as I said in my presentation, um, potentially a 62 wind turbine wind farm, which because of that scale, it, it would be um, 
dealt with under Section 36 of the Electricity Act, which would in turn mean it would be submitted to the Scottish Government Energy Consent Unit. Um, the Council would be a consultee in that process. Um, we would report our thoughts and our recommendation that we want to send back to the Scottish Government to committee. Um, we have the opportunity at that point to um, object to the application. The one thing I would say, if if that was the case, then the final decision decision rests with the Scottish Government. But if we object, then there would need to be um, a public inquiry held in, into the proposals. Um, so that, that's how the process works. And, and in terms of whether it's this is a um, an appropriate proposal, as I said, we have to deal with what's in front of us. It, it's for a mast and, and nothing more than that. Um, the, landscape capacity and landscape impact is, is a major issue and a major um, key consideration in any application. But there will also be other um, issues as, as we go through that application process. Um, but at, at the present time, we, we cannot decline to to determine this application. We have to uh, deal with it in accordance on its own merits, in accordance with the development plan. And the assessment concludes that it, it is appropriate, especially in terms of the visual impact. And we, and we can't take into account anything that might happen at some point in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Councillor Lockhart. He's on mute. Councillor Lockhart, did you want to come back in? Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Fat finger that was. Um, yeah, I'd just like to carry on along the line, if you like, that I was talking and, and I know that Tony's answered it in a way, but if this application is on a site that is already a designated turbine free corridor, has it been designated as such? And if so, are we simply not um, wasting everybody's time by um, if you like listening to this application when we've already been told by a higher authority, presumably the Scottish government or someone like that, that this is a turbine free corridor. I mean, who's de who's designated it and is there a line on a map which says it is? Thank you. I think Tony's already answered that, but did you want to come back in, Tony? Uh, I will, yes, just in terms of the, the status of, of the site and whether it's a turbine free corridor. I think what the applicant, uh, sorry, the object is getting at is that this part of the M74 at the moment is, is turbine free and um, the, the impact on users of the motorway when it comes to the assessment of a detailed application would be key and that would be a key issue um, because further down the M74 you've got Clyde Wind Farm for example which is um, which creates a bit of a corridor for, for turbines it's, it's it's fair to say um, but there's no there's nothing designate, designated on a map to say this area shall be wind turbine free and um, it would be assessed against policy and guidance in, in our policy and uh, supplementary guidance and national policy um, so I, th I think that's where the object is coming from Council Lockhart. Okay thank you. Thank you, Tony. There's another hand up, Stuart, but I don't know whose it is. Councillor McLaughlin, Chair. Thank you. Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I, I just start to worry, Chair, that we're discussing this because people might not like the idea rather than dealing with the planning application on its merits. Now, I hear what Richard and, and, and Alec are saying about it. And if it is designated a, a wind free area, I suppose in a way that's similar to an area being designated green belt. At some point down the road, that changes and you can then build on that green belt area. Things can change and and it could well be, and I don't blame anyone who wants to have a wind farm to have an allocation like that. I don't want I don't blame anybody who lives in the area not wanting it for aesthetic reasons. But you know, I feel as though we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time discussing something here, and Pauline's explained it quite clearly, I think, and so has Tony, that, that this is a planning application. We're dealing with it on its merits. And and, and we all know, I think we can all recognise that, that, that they're looking, it's a scoping exercise to see if they, at some point in the future they might want to do that. But that should be dealt with at that time, if and when it ever comes. I just think we should move on here and just deal with this. Uh, you know, the, the, there isn't any good reasons to refuse it in planning terms. So we, we just bite the bullet and go on and we deal with a bigger issue if and when that ever becomes a bigger issue. 
Thank you. I shall move the report. I'll second it, Chair. Agree the report? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item six, which page 47 to 66 materials take us through the item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a detailed planning application for a further development at Castle Basket, sorry, Cross Basket Castle, um, and it's off Stony Meadow Road. The application site consists at the moment of the castle itself. Um, it's an A-listed building and they had extended it to provide a ballroom and ceremony room, all associated with a small uh, nine-bedroom hotel. And it, it performs uh, as a wedding venue, a restaurant and a bar. Um, the applicant is now seeking detailed permission for a much bigger um, development within the grounds. Um, they're demolishing a small dwelling house that was there um, and erecting the, a new hotel, a spa, restaurant and four lodges. Um, at the moment, the, uh, prior to COVID, the, the, the venue was operating successfully. As a, as a wedding venue, um, but there is not the scope for people to stay over, um, just a small um, number of bedrooms. Um, so my understanding is that at the moment they use um, other hotels and bus people to, to these hotels. Um, so this would allow the facilities to all be on site. The consultations are set out in section four of the report. Um, one that I would highlight, we've had a lot of detailed discussions um, through our roads uh, team, um, and Fraser's been involved in that. Um, roads have got no objections in principle, um, subject to conditions um, in terms of the number of uh, car parking spaces, etc. There will be a travel plan, um, and that would include details of construction traffic um, and a management plan, and uh, that would be all conditions um, should uh, consent be granted. Um, I would highlight plan uh, economic development. Our colleagues in economic development services are very supportive of the application. Um, it welcome, it, they welcome the plans to expand here, um, Cross Basket Castle as a hotel and, and wedding venue. We've asked for the um, details in terms of jobs. Um, there's approximately 106 construction uh, direct jobs is uh, estimated. Um, and 100 indirect jobs in terms of materials and, and behind the scenes. Um, but once the uh, expanded business would be up and running, they're looking at um, 35,000 visitors a year um, and securing an extra additional 52 uh, jobs on site. Historic Envi Environment Scotland have also been heavily involved just because it's an A-listed building. Um, and they had come back and made some uh, suggestions um, about reducing the impact of the overall development on the setting. Um, and the plans have been revised, taking into consideration the, the details um, from Historic Environment uh, Scotland. And the simple, in, in, that included simplifying the internal road layout, footpath, footpath network. They were particularly interested in the visibility of the castle. Um, from the entrance to the site and the driveway. Um, so all of that has been taken into consideration. In terms of representations, um, we have received 10 letters of representations. There is a small development um, very close to the boundary of the site, um, cross bow um, development, and we've received letters from the people that, that live there. Um, 10 letters of, of representation, including one comments letter. Um, and a number of issues have been raised as set out in section five of the report. Um, I would say that the developers and the owners of the castle have a good have had a good relationship with neighbours, um, and there's been a lot of discussion directly with neighbours. Um, but we do have the representations. Um, they are summarised, as I say, um, focus on ecological um, interest. Um, there was an eco ecological assessment undertaken. And we're happy that, that that's um, been done properly. Um, there was no protected species actually identified, um, so there, there's a, there, there was no issues in the, the proposal. Um, trees was another concern um, in terms of the tree loss. There are some trees to come down. We have a full tree survey, but the majority of trees are being retained along the boundary um, and also the boundary with crossbow. Um, beside crossbow, there, there's a kind of woodland walkway, 
So there's a remote footpath. So you have you have trees that will be retained. You have a walkway there, um, and then that moves into the into the site into the development. In terms of amenity, that's all been taken into consideration. Um, the the site's eastern boundary with Crossbow Gardens. The staff car parks on that. And the, the spa area. The spa area is mainly indoor, but there's a small outdoor area. Um, but it's enclosed by a high wall. Um, and we've looked at the the main banqueting uh, hall and ceremony room is a lot further uh, west, um, away from the houses. Um, having said all of that, um, environmental services have asked for an noise survey to be attached, um, a condition. Um, so that, that, that's been done. There are actually two noise uh, conditions, one relating to the assessment and the other one specifically in relation to music that could emanate from the venue. Um, but as I say, the, the venue has been operating uh, and the main banqueting hall is, is enclosed and further away from, from the houses. Um, returning to our uh, assessment and conclusion, um, the development would be constructed uh, within the estate. Um, it is an A-listed building, but we've taken full cognizance of, the, of that um, and worked with Historic Scotland. The new facilities would ensure um, it's a major investment, but it would ensure the continued successful future of the castle as a five star hotel and wedding venue um, and to the wider benefit of the community of South Lanarkshire in terms of as customers and, and employees. As I've said, economic development um, strongly supported the application. Um, and at 6.9, we reiterate um, the, the business benefits and, and the employment needs, uh, sorry, employment benefits. So therefore recommending approval, Chair, um, subject to the conditions attached. Thank you, Tina. Any questions for Tina? Councillor Thompson? Hello, can you hear me, Chair? Yes. Hello. Ah, good, thanks. No, just to say I welcome this uh, development, short and long term, term employment. It borders on three different councillors' areas. Uh, I think we're all delighted. I'm sure we are. Uh, it was doing very well before lockdown, and I'm sure it will in the future. All I'd ask is the council to work very, very closely. It's an area of natural beauty, and it's the minimum of trees that are disrupted and the wildlife. And I'm sure that the, in the future, it will reap rewards for Blantyre and South Lanarkshire. It's an asset, and I'm looking forward to it being developed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. I would like to echo the comments that have already been made. I think this is a great asset for tourism within South Lanarkshire uh, and bringing jobs as well. Um, so I would totally welcome this development. Uh, and it's the right way going forward. And I'll not be getting married in it, but uh, I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy if they ha hold their wedding there. I'm sure they'll have a great time. Thank you. Thank you. Don't see any other hands, so I'll move the report. I'll second it, Chair. Agree the report? Agreed. 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 <clears throat> Thank you. Moving on to agenda item seven, and that's on page 67 to 82, and that's an album for Bernard. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Permission is sought for the change of use of vacant office premises to a licensed restaurant with bar and associated takeaway facilities. There would also be <coughs> the installation of our external extraction system. The property is a sandstone building dating from the 1930s, which is listed and occupies a prominent location on Cadzo Street, diagonally opposite the townhouse. It was last used for office purposes and has been vacant for approximately five years. The proposal seeks to convert the building to a licensed restaurant with bar, associated takeaway extraction system, and internally there would be a seating area, kitchen, takeaway service area, toilets and storage area. The proposed external alterations to the property include the installation of the extraction system, along with some minor alterations, and these are also covered by a separate application for listed building consent, which has been assessed under delegated powers. In terms of the local plan, the application site is designated as part of the general urban area and conservation area in both the adopted and emerging local plans. 
No issues have been raised by consultees and their comments are noted in section four of the report. There have been six objections to the proposal and the issues raised are summarised in section six. In addition to those objections, there have been 105 letters of support which support the proposal. The key issues raised by supporters of the application include that the proposal will result in the reuse of a vacant property, which could fall into disrepair if it's not brought back into use. The new business would create jobs. The restaurant will add a variety of offers to the surrounding area and the business could potentially bring more people to Hamilton Town Centre who may use shops and other facilities. In terms of the assessment of the proposal, it relates to the occupation of a long term vacant building which is situated in a prominent corner site. It's in close proximity to Hamilton Town Centre and there are a mixture of uses in the surrounding area. The proposed use is considered to be acceptable and in addition, the proposed alterations to the property are considered to be relatively minor in nature and will not adversely affect either the character or appearance of the conservation area. The proposal is considered to be acceptable and complies with the relevant policies contained in both the adopted and proposed local plans, since it is an acceptable form of development at this location and not of a detrimental impact on the amenity of the surrounding area. It is recommended that planning permission is granted subject to conditions. Thank you, Bernard. Any questions for Bernard? I'll move the report. I'll second that. Agree the report? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item eight, Tony Finn is going to provide committee members with an update on some planning matters. Thank you, Tony. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it, it, the update relates to proposals for um, an energy recovery centre on land at Overwood Farm, the Lark Hall. We don't have a live application for these proposals yet. Um, I did send a brief note to the elected members in wards 4, 5 and 20 at the end of January and then um, to all elected members on the 10th of February this year just to update them on, on what was happening in, in terms of the process. So while it's not a live application, uh, the, the process has started and I'll explain that just now where we are with that. Um, in the brief note, I advised that the proposals fall within the definition of a major development. So statutory pre-application constant consultation has to be carried out by the developers before a plan application can be submitted and the time period for that um, consultation period is a minimum of 12 weeks. So what's called a proposal of application notice setting out the type and range of consultation they intended to carry out was submitted to the council on the 29th of January. Now the documents provided with the notice um, they've been published on a planning portal on the council's website and in addition those details were also advertised in the local press so the applicants, um, as part of this process, they set up a dedicated website, and this includes a digital exhibition display boards and uh, an interact interactive questionnaire and feedback form. In addition, um, they are proposing two virtual public exhibitions which will be held um, with separate live chat sessions to accompany them. The first session actually took place last Thursday with a follow up uh, this Thursday. And there'll be a second series of dates um, with further exhibitions and feedback um, or in, 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 in April. So in the brief note, I explained that the pre-application consultation is developer-led and the council has got no role in this part of the process. But we've, we've become aware that members have been contacted by members of the public to outline their concerns about the proposals. And in addition, the planning service has received approximately 750 letters of representation as part of that process. Now, we, we can't take those comments into consideration at the present time, um, but we have acknowledged them and we've also forwarded the comments to Rudor for them to take into account when they prepare their pre-application consultation report. Um, a number of those who have made representations have queried the suitability of carrying out um, this process in the middle of the current pandemic. However, in April last year, the Scottish Government published um, temporary guidance on this issue, this issue, which is still in place. 
and, and this removed the need to hold what would normally be a public event and allow alternative means, uh, including online events. So we are quite satisfied that the applicant's proposals comply with that guidance. At the same time, um, a request for a scoping opinion has been received by the council. Now, this is in relation to the environmental impact assessment that will be required uh, to be submitted with the application for the proposals. Scoping so request seeks the views of the council and other statutory consultees on what the EIA should include. And that includes likes of um, the methodology to be used in various studies that need to be carried out, and also specific issues such as agreeing viewpoints um, from various uh, vantage points in, in the area. So we have actually received comments in relation to that from a local action group. Um, now, they're not a cons statutory consultee in this case, um, but where relevant, their comments will be incorporated into the council's response back to um, back to the applicants. And they will also, like the, um, the, the, the comments received in relation to the pre-applic consultation, they'll be forwarded to Verdor as well. So going forward, we expect the application and the EIA to, to be submitted to the council at the end of May. At that time, we will carry out statutory consultation, including with local community councils in the area, and we'll also carry out any associated neighbour notification and publicity. At that point, the local communities will have the opportunity to make representations of the council, and they'll be taken into account when we um, assess the application. So that, that, that's awfully um, uh, helpful for members. In the meantime, if you've got any questions, please contact myself or Gwen McCracken or James Wright and my team. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Tony. So I don't have any other further business. So I'll ask Stuart to stop the recording and I'll close the meeting. Thank you all for your attendance. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Bye.